so welcome everybody. This is Emily Levine with the Autism Society of Southeastern Wisconsin. And on behalf of the Autism Society in Gemini, we would like to welcome Dr. Amy Van Hickey from Marquette to talk about the PEERS program. Amy? Yes, thank you, Emily. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Amy Van Hecke, and I'm a professor of psychology at Marquette. I'm part of the autism initiative there and co-direct the Next Step Autism and Trauma Clinic. So I'm glad to be here today. And I'm talking today about Marquette Peers. Um, so just to start off, I always like to kind of make sure we're all on the same base with conflicts of interest. So uh, just so you know, I have no uh, direct financial benefit from peers. Uh, I also have no direct financial benefit from the Next Step Clinic. So I'm just paid what my salary is at Marquette and don't derive any personal income um, beyond that from these programs. So why a program like peers? Why would it be important to think about a, a social program for people on the autism spectrum? Um, so when we look at outcomes uh, of people on the spectrum, um, especially in the social areas, uh, we often see that they're not what they could be. Um, many people with autism uh, describe their friendships as being of poor quality or not being the, the quantity or the quality that they would like. Um, they describe being isolated, being bullied and traumatized by other individuals, um, and then exhibiting, I would say, limited independence. Uh, be, so not what we would expect in terms of their ability to be independent. 80% um, of adults might still live at home or unemployed or underemployed. Um, and then with that constellation, we also sometimes see mental health challenges. So increased rates of depression and anxiety and suicidality. Um, so not all people in the spectrum, but many people in the spectrum kind of report that this area is something that affects them. Uh, it's not what they would like it to be um, and that they feel like they need help with it. So what can we do about improving uh, this area, these social outcomes and these independence and mental health outcomes for, for our people on the spectrum? Okay, next one. So why is this important? Uh, we know that friendships are protective uh, in, in all people. So people with high quality friendships live longer lives. They have less rates of heart disease and inflammatory diseases, um, almost to the point of where we should have prescription for, for having friendships, for having um, contact with friends, that this is just as important as exercise, for example. Um, but in autism, we see that uh, many people are, are not having that protective effect. Uh, we see rates of premature death rates being higher in autism, um, more kind of inflammatory diseases and even things like cancer and suicide. Um, so that we wonder whether this social protective effect is part of that picture and why maybe people are not um, having those, those long healthy lives that we would expect. Could it be due to the fact that they don't have the friendships kind of helping their, their, their health along and their mental health along? Next slide, please. Um, so what can we do? Uh, one thing that would be important to think on first is to focus on the strengths of people with autism. So uh, people on the spectrum can be very loyal friends and honest in their judgment of others, um, but they just might need a little help in finding their tribe uh, and finding the people that they get, get along with, that they kind of click with. And, you know, I think we've all experienced this when, you know, we shifted from high school to college of where, you know, we just maybe didn't have our people yet. And then we found them with the more kind of increased opportunities that we might have had in a wider setting. Um, and so this is kind of what we're trying to do is to help these, these preschoolers and teens and young adults with autism find their people and who they want to be friends with. Um, they may also need help in determining the quality of friendships, whether they're reciprocal and not abusive. You know, when we're talking about friendships that are protective, we're talking about reciprocal friendships, not paid friendships, not someone doing it for volunteer hours. So really equal uh, reciprocal uh, relationships is what we're, we're aiming for. High quality, not quantity, but high quality, even just one, that's all we need. Individuals may just need help in setting up the life that supports their well-being and helps them reach their social goals and helps them with uh, really leading the full fulfilling life that they would like to have. Okay, next slide. All right, so the PEERS intervention um, aims to kind of address those areas and it's an acronym, we love them. Uh, it stands for the Program for the Education and Enrichment of Relational Skills. Um, it's a 14 week for the teens, 16 weeks for adults and preschoolers um, skills program with manuals, which is really important for people wanting to go out and do the program um, outside the teenagers the young adults, the preschoolers, uh, as well to provide it in schools for the adolescents. Um, caregivers meet uh, 
concurrently. So they're included, meet in their own group. Um, and the, the program is focusing on concrete steps and lessons with practice and homework assignments to ensure that it's carried over and not just something learned in a group and done in a group. Um, and really is focusing on the skills that they need to make and keep at least one high quality friend, um, which was nice for us from a neuroscience perspective of hoping to see a specific uh, goal of the program. So really having this focus on friendships rather than being more broadband. Um, we could kind of predict what areas of the brain might respond to that. Okay, next slide. Okay, so uh, whenever we look at therapies in autism, we wanna make sure that there is an evidence base that these uh, programs have been studied, have been published in journals, um, have been um, you know, studied by people who did not develop the program, you know, so there's less potential for any bias that might occur. Um, and uh, so here are just a few of those. Pierce has been studied really extensively. The ones circled are the ones from Marquette. Um, and you know, there, there's a broad, broad base of evidence, which is really lovely. When we first kind of got peers, it was younger. It was still the best uh, available at the time. And I would say, say that the evidence base has just built over time, um, which is wonderful to see kind of the replications and the repeated kind of findings of it being helpful um, for many individuals across many areas of the world. Um, for many different kinds of outcomes. Um, so that's something really encouraging to see. Uh, PEERS has a wonderful evidence base. So when I was looking as well for treatments that I could look at that might affect brain activity, I wanted something that was already shown to be helpful, something that was already published. Um, and PEERS at the time really was one of the few. So there's more now than there was back then, um, but really it was one of the few and one of the first to really target adolescents uh, and to really have kind of a, um, a really nice base of evidence that was published in the scientific literature. Um, these ones that are circled are a few of our studies out of Marquette, and there are many, many more. Um, so there's many, many different sites across the country and across the world that have run peers and have, have published their studies about the effects of peers, um, both in autism and as well as in other groups. So peers has been shown effective uh, for, for adolescents with ADHD, adolescents with autism, other ages with autism. Um, as well as some more mixed, what they call mixed clinical groups at UCLA, of like adolescents with depression or anxiety. Um, so there's some nice uh, evidence that friendship skills kind of are helpful for a lot of people to know. Okay, Nicholas, next one. All right, so back to that Evans base. What, it, what is that? Um, so for the UCLA studies, um, and uh, one of those listed there, the Shoal et al. is one of our Marquette studies. Um, they found that for adolescents, peers uh, increased social skills knowledge, increased their contact with other teens, improved their friendship quality, and that these effects lasted. So that's another important thing to think about is, you know, is this a short-term thing and then it's kind of done? Did they make a friend in the program and then it's over? Um, the UCLA data indicates that's not the case, that the effects lasted three to five years later. Um, so very important to show that they had that longevity. Um, since then, I mentioned already the young adult program and the school-based version, um, peers have spread around the world. So it's been um, adapted and studied in other countries, in South Korea, in Israel, the Netherlands, in China, Japan, Canada, um, uh, pretty much, you know, all over Europe. Um, uh, all, I would say the one area that, that lacks being studied that I hope is the next area to be studied is Central and South America and Mexico. So I think that's where they're focusing some of their next efforts are to really kind of um, not just translate it, but validate it for the culture uh, and make sure that it's something that meshes with the culture, which they had to do for the, particularly the Korean and um, Israeli models, because there's different social mores in those cultures. Um, so they do that first and then they make sure it's still something that's helpful in that, in those cultures. Um, so it's, it's, kind of all over, which is really nice to see that it's kind of spread and people find it helpful in a lot of different places. And Amy, if I can just step in as a, as a parent of someone who's been through it, I think it's probably that they only studied it three and five years out, but these are just real social skills that my son Max got and uses, and I, I, it's not going to go away. They're new skills he has, and he just builds on them. So I would say, I know as a scientist, you can only say it lasts as long as you test, but these seem like lifelong skills are building. Yeah, and you know, it's one of those things where once you kind of have the framework, and that's what's so um, really gratifying for us to work with the program is that, you know, a lot of our individuals that come through peers, they have the, cap the capacity, they just don't know the rules, they don't know the steps, they don't know the mechanics. Um, so once they have the mechanics and kind of the, the know-how and can use it, um, it really can last. It's one of those things like kind of, you know, riding a bike, once you get on and get going and you learn how to do it, um, it does kind of require that you keep doing it, 
right? That you keep practicing and keep from getting rusty. Um, but if you do do that, you do you do some nice long uh, long effects lasting out, um, and effects too in the direction of people, other teens reciprocating, right? So you know, like one of our metrics is like the number of get-togethers that teens have. And what we see in the three to five year out studies is that other teens are inviting these teens to hang out with them. So reciprocal kind of effects, not just the teens continuing doing it, but other teens responding to them, which is really nice to see. Yeah, my son had his first actual teen boys getting together and doing things after the peers program. Um, yeah, right. Not, and, and that can definitely, you know, it was interesting with uh, our last group we just had, which happened during the shutdown and the pandemic. Um, you know, we were like, well, we can't tell you to go have get togethers, uh, at least not in person. So we're going to hope that that transitions to once we can get together again, um, that that happens, you know, so we had to come up with kind of a plan B for those teens. Um, but it, it can sometimes be a little bit longer, particularly in, I would say, our uh, individuals in the spectrum with higher anxiety. So it takes a bit longer with that um, to kind of get over that hump of anxiety get past that, get the practice in and the successes in and build that platform of success um, before you might see some of the stronger, like, you know, friendship takes time, right? You don't kind of immediately yeah. become friends. And I think um, for, for the parents who are listening, the, the, the one thing that was powerful for me to hear, uh, I knew it, um, but it was especially powerful for Max to hear was, um, I think he felt like he was born without social skills, like somehow it was a fundamental deficiency he had. And they just made it very clear that it's a skill like any other skill. You can't knit. If you learn to knit, you can knit. Talking to people and learning those social cues are just a skill. You will have it as soon as you work on it and practice it. And I think that was a relief for him, that it wasn't something, this permanent situation where he wouldn't have friends, that it was a skill set. And he yeah. was eager to work with it and, and kept it going. Yeah, and that's, I think, the brilliance of it, too, was like, as I saw uh, Liz Lagerson, who's the one who, who developed it at UCLA, as I saw her kind of, um, I kept seeing her at conferences with more and more data on this before it was published. And really the way they get at it is kind of genius because they really kind of broke it down of like, okay, what does a successful get together look like? What does a successful conversation look like? And they broke it down into kind of the different steps that people do without knowing they do. And then when you have that, then you can say, okay, now we're going to teach that. We're going to break it down into a format that is easily taught um, and that you know, people can learn, um, and, and it really caters to the cognitive style. Yeah, I mean, and, oh, sorry, and I just find, you know, when I see brilliance, brilliance normally cloaks itself as common sense, um, and when I was here, everything they were teaching my son seemed so obvious, and I would have never been able to break it down like they did, but everyone was like, yeah, that's, that is what I do, that is what I do, and, and so I could help Max and really understand it. Yeah, my uh, my first training to my daughter, this was years ago, because she's now 12, almost 12. She was two. But she came with us out to UCLA, and my husband took her to the park while I had the trainings. And um, one day, you know, the days he came back and saw my handouts, and he was looking through them, and he's like, oh, you know, this one about, like, joining a conversation, he's like, that happens to me at conferences all the time. Like, how do I join this group that's talking? And he was like, these are really good tips. Yeah, I know, <laughs> yeah. I know. Just for you as an adult. Yeah, I know. I agree. <laughs> Yeah, and he was like, can I look at that? And I was like, yeah, isn't it awesome? <laughs> you know? Oh, okay, excellent. All right, Nicholas, next one, please. All right, so and there would be some animation on this. There we go. All right, so how do we do the things we do at Marquette? Um, so what we do at Marquette are called randomized controlled trials. So since we're doing studies on outcomes and how peers affects the brain and how peers affects um, behaviors and things like that, we have to look at this in a very structured way. So we have, you know, groups of, of teens or preschoolers or young adults, and we randomly assign them to either get peers right away or to be waiting for peers. Um, so we assess them kind of at one point, and then one of the groups goes on to get peers, one of the groups waits, and then we assess them again at the end of peers. And that way we can compare and make sure that it's peers that's kind of fueling the development of those individuals and not just getting older. Right, so if we didn't have that group that was waiting, we wouldn't really be sure what the effect was from. Um, so that's why we do the, the research that way. Okay, next one. Um, and then our outcomes, because we've been doing this since about 2009, 2010, we have a lot of sub-studies. So we've looked at um, reports from teens, reports from teachers and parents on social skills, on mental health outcomes, on families. Uh, we've looked at observations. We've had teens interact with other teens that they don't know. Uh, before and after the program and looked at how those interactions go. 
and then we've also looked at the brain stuff. So that's the, I'm the brain geek. That's my thing. Um, and we've looked at how the brain um, changes uh, maybe due to peers. Uh, we've also looked at things like heart rate, um, the kind of the fight or flight response. So that's electrodermal activity. We've looked at brain structure using magnetic resonance imaging, diffusion tensor imaging, um, and functional brain activity with uh, fMRIs. Um, so we're really interested in um, kind of saying that friendships are impactful and that it, this, this age group can show a lot of change and a lot of positive change, uh, both in their behavior and in their physiology and neurophysiology. And that's important because, you know, it didn't used to be the story, right? The story was we need to get the little kids. We need to get the little, the babies, the preschoolers, and that by the time they're five or six, you haven't gotten them, they're, they're kind of done and you've missed a window. And so it was very important to us to say that that's not true, that adolescents and young adults can show a lot of growth and that we can quantify that with these, you know, very like, you know, observable, um, scientific, uh, unbiased measures of the brain, um, that it wasn't just people hoping that they got better and, and thinking they did, but that it was this uh, very unbiased measure of how the brain is reacting to these, these um, therapies. Um, so that's kind of where we set out with us really trying to say that adolescents, particularly and young adults, really have this beautiful window of brain development and of opportunity and that that's never too late. Um, to support people and help them reach their goals and have well-being. Okay, the next one, please. So what have we found? Um, so this is a lot, a lot of little arrows, and I apologize, um, but um, this is our teen and our adult data. Um, so in the teens, the, the basic sum is that we did something called replication. So we, we repeated what UCLA had found. So when we brought it to Milwaukee, you know, we didn't assume at that time um, there weren't any any other studies out of peers besides the ones out at UCLA. So maybe it was some magical effect of UCLA, right? They're a fantastic place. <laughs> maybe they, they did it, right? Uh, maybe it's Liz Lagos and she's amazing. Uh, maybe, you know, it won't carry over. Um, so that was our first big task was, will it carry over in the Midwest? And basically what we found was that it did. Our experimental group, that's the EXP, um, that got the peers treatment showed improvements in social skills, um, improvements in get-togethers with other teens, decreases in anxiety, decreases in some autism, problematic autism symptoms like problem behaviors and depression. Um, they also were more expressive and had better rapport in their interactions. Um, and a similar pattern with our adults, we saw more positive emotion, uh, less negative emotion, less depression, um, better social cognition and motivation, um, and all these kind of outcomes that UCLA had seen. So we basically were able to say, yes, this still carries over even in Milwaukee when it's not UCLA doing it. And a big piece of that was that Piers has manuals, which is really important in science because a lot of studies will come out, but there'll never be a manual for what they actually did so that other people can do and try to repeat it. Um, and Piers is really good about putting out manuals that are available even on Amazon that anyone could get and kind of study and try to replicate and redo what they did. Um, so that was a big help for us and able to, you know, to, to bring it to Marquette and do it with the same kind of exact methods that UCLA had done. Okay, next one. So what were our, my, my brain geek kind of findings, what were the effects on the brain? Um, so uh, for our adolescents, what we saw were a couple of things. Um, one is an older finding and one is newer. The first thing we found was really about electrical activity in the brain and how it's balanced across the hemispheres. Um, so we saw in our group that got peers a shift in that balance to where they had more relative left hemisphere activity than right. Um, over the course of the program, uh, and that our weightless group did not show that change. Um, and the amount of change in this, sh this balance, this left hemisphere kind of dominance, you could call it, was related to how many get-togethers the kids had uh, and how much knowledge they gained. So it's, we linked it to kind of other outcomes. Um, so left hemisphere is important because it's kind of our, it's our communicative hemisphere. It's where a lot of our language is kind of uh, located. It's also where when we see left-right kind of comparisons, it's the approach hemisphere. So it's about social approach. It's about um, positive emotion. Uh, it's, it's about, you know, really initiating with other people. And so to see a shift to where their brain activity was more indicative of left hemisphere is important because that's kind of a well-being finding in a lot of ways. So it was really interesting to me because I don't think we were necessarily expecting like emotional brain effects, um, but that's basically what we saw was this is a well-being. But this is a, a happy well-being brain um, that we're seeing in these teens that, that got the program. Um, 
More recently, we've actually shown, so that was activity. Um, more recently, we've shown actual change in structures in the brain. So we've seen decreases in size in a structure called the amygdala, which is a sort of a, a very deep brain structure that's involved with the fight or flight response. Um, and so that's really exciting. No other study has ever shown this um, for a social skills treatment or any, any treatment actually in autism to show that structures in the brain change in their size or volume um, in, in individuals who participate in the, in the intervention. So that's really exciting for us. Um, in our adults, uh, we've seen changes in brain activity as well that are related to changes in depression scores. So once again, the emotional brain. So it's really interesting that um, a lot of our neural findings, all of our neural findings actually are related to things like emotion, the fight or flight response. So, you know, not to like, there's no friendship area in the brain, but what we see is that friendships are affecting the emotions and the well-being of these individuals and that's affecting their brain activity and structure. So it's kind of exciting. All right, next one. Um, so how do you uh, access peers? How do you get to do, to do peers? Um, so if you're in Wisconsin, uh, Peers is available at Marquette. Um, Peers is also available around the state. Uh, there are other providers. Um, so I'll quickly go over that. Um, that second bullet point, um, many cities, there have been multiple kind of people that have gone to UCLA, private therapists, school psychologists, speech pathologists. Um, they've gone to UCLA and gotten the training. Um, if you wanted to be a Peers facilitator, they're now offering that as an online um, training. So you can actually get trained in Peers to, to be a facilitator. Um, and uh, so we have different sites around Wisconsin that do that, so private psychologists for the most part, I would say. Um, there is a group, I want to say, at, at UW Lacrosse that's doing it at UW as well. Um, and you can go to the UCLA's website to look for the list of certified providers. Um, through Marquette, because it's a research uh, initiative, it's um, done through the Autism Initiative. Um, it's uh, much less expensive than it would be from a private provider. So, you know, you can expect to pay anywhere from, I would say, a thousand to three to four thousand dollars from a private provider, and then your insurance might kick in and that kind of thing. Um, but at Marquette, it's four hundred dollars for the whole fourteen or sixteen weeks, and then we have sliding scales. So we do. Um, commit to offering it to families regardless of their ability to pay. So there's that. Um, and we're able to do that because we're utilizing grad students um, to help run the groups and be leaders. So that's how we're able to get around um, having it cost for Marquette. Um, and then we're doing research around it too. So we're contributing to research. Um, during uh, the current time, so we had to switch uh, spring semester. We had a group that was in session seven of 14 when we had the safer home order go into place. So uh, we had to actually uh, really switch gears and, and put it online and do it online, um, figure out what does social interaction during COVID-19 mean. <laughs> um, basically, it means things like Zoom happy hours, it means FaceTime, right? It means all these, these uh, physically distant ways of interacting. So that's what we did, and that's what UCLA kind of taught us to do and, and helped us figure out how to do. Um, and I would say it was, it was good. The kids really, the, the group we had really, um, they were great. They were glad to have the outlet. They were glad to keep up with each other and to continue learning the material and practicing it to the extent that they could with their families and online with other kids. Um, we did assignments like have a Zoom get together or have a house party get together, you know, online where you play games. Um, so we did do all that shift. And that is actually the plan for fall as well, is that we will be holding our groups online for fall. Spring is still kind of TBD, whether they'll be in person or not. Um, but the plan for now is to continue in that mode, uh, the, the telehealth mode. Um, that might be good for some individuals who live far away uh, from um, Marquette. Uh, we, in the past, we've had families travel to Milwaukee from as far away as Indiana every week, um, from Green Bay, from Sheboygan, from uh, Madison. And so that might be helpful if people wanted to participate and they're further away that the online model might be um, a better bet. They don't have to have all that travel time. Um, but that's how we will be doing it for fall is the, the, the shift to Zoom, which is pretty much how a lot of things have done anyway as well. Okay, next one. Um, and so to kind of wrap up and leave some time for questions, if anyone has any, um, you know, what we've really kind of committed to with peers is that healthy friendships are really important. They have these direct effects that we think um, are, are really great to focus on and to kind of ensure that our autistic individuals have that, that benefit as well. Um, and then there's this corollary of being protective against kind of secondary things like mental health challenges, depression and suicidality and anxiety. 
And that's an interesting thought too, uh, in this day and age where mental health services for people on the spectrum are kind of hard to find. It's hard to find therapists to treat um, depression for someone on the spectrum, for example, because you know not as many people are familiar with the autism spectrum and then having the autism spectrum and the mental health training together is sometimes rare. So what we kind of are proposing is that until we have better capacity with therapists who know how to do therapy um, for people on the spectrum, perhaps one way to sort of protect our people on the spectrum from these mental health challenges is to focus on their social relationships. So if social relationships are protected, then maybe we would kind of preempt the need for that kind of extra therapies on those ends. May not happen completely, right? So some people may still need therapies for anxiety or suicidality, um, but it could be something that could kind of diminish the effects of those, of those extra considerations. Um, and then to kind of think about really, you know, this focus in, on friendships as really being targeted on focusing not on treating someone's autism, but on helping them feel successful, helping them achieve their social goals. Um, so one thing I didn't really go into with peers is that um, at Marquette to be in peers, the adolescent has to say they want to be there, that they want to learn how to make friends, that this is something they want to do so that they're not kind of there because someone else wants them there. Um, and that's a big piece of it is that we want, to, we want to say, okay, you would like to learn how to make friends and then we will help you with that. We don't want it to be the other way around us telling them they need to make friends because that's just gonna not be successful in our, in our experience. Um, you know, and, people, Amy, oh, mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah, and one ahead. of the things as a, as a parent that I noticed was, um, you know, Max definitely wanted to do it. It was a bit dicey on how to introduce it. So we, we came about, everybody knows their own child well. One of the things that, that Dr. Gantman told us, because he ran the program there, um, but one of the things he said is that they did it as co-ed, and it kind of perked all the young boys' ears up. It was like, they're girls. They're, they're girls. Yeah. Yeah, I can talk to those girls. So that, if any parents out there going, what will motivate my child to go and learn, that is something, you know, we use what we got, and that was one of the things we used. Yeah, you know, whatever whatever it takes. And it's actually, it's really interesting, because it's one of, another one of those things where in, you know, 10, 15 years ago, Many people would have said, well, people on the spectrum don't want friends or they're asocial or they have no social motivation, right? You would have heard those things. And the more we've learned, it's, it's that the picture is much more um, complex, right, than that. You know, what we're dealing with in adolescence is, is a child or a teen that has probably been harassed and bullied and rejected. And so if you say, do you want to make friends? They might say no, because they're, they're fearful, right, of, of things that they've experienced that have so negative. So it may not necessarily be that they don't want it, but that they're fearful about it, right? So then it's really kind of having a conversation about like, what if it was in an environment where you felt safe? What if we told you you could stop at any time? What if we, you know, try it and see how it goes, right? And, you know, we do have kids that don't complete the program and that's okay. Uh, we offer them to come back at another time if they decide they would like to come back. Um, we had one team that really didn't like the online version. So we, they said they would you know, be finished at that time and come back when we were back in person, that's okay as well. Um, you know, it's really important that that kind of, they, they kind of want to be there and that it's a fit. Um, because when you're doing a group, the group dynamic is important. And, um, Amy, one of the things I saw too, um, mm -hmm. was that Max had, you know, we're just all being honest here as parents yeah. together, but um, Max kind of had an aversion, like, I don't want to go and be labeled in an autistic group. I don't know if I want to be around kids who are autistic. Like, it, like I don't, put, don't put me in a box like that. Um, but when he got there, you know, what I know as, as an older adult is the, the kids with autism might not be cool to their teen peers, but they're really cool, interesting people to older adults. And Max found all the boys and girls there really interesting. Well, and I think it changed his whole idea about what ASD was in general. I think it gave him a lot of confidence. He made some friends there. So um, that's just other issues I was dealing with. Yeah, definitely. And so are you, you're in California? Yes. I'm, I'm half in Wisconsin, half in Wisconsin. Half, yeah. Yeah. So that's an interesting too. I think, you know, when we brought in Wisconsin, we were like, I wonder what things will be different in Wisconsin versus like the California groups. And there were some little things we had to change. Like there's a session on like which group do you fit in with at school and there was the surfer group and so that you know yeah. <laughs> um not so much <laughs> Wisconsin, that, and, you know, Max grew we, up Max grew yeah. up in Spokane Washington which if there's a city that's really close to Wisconsin and feel I feel very comfortable in Wisconsin because I spent a lot of time in Spokane Washington it's mm -hmm. kind of 
it's right on the Idaho border. It feels very middle America. It just feels, it's a very similar tone. So he was not a California kid. He was more like a Wisconsin kid at a California Peers program. So, yeah, it was just funny that our kids, you know, we were like, well, what group would we have in Wisconsin that they don't have in Los Angeles? And they were like, oh, the 4-H kids. And we were like, oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that would be it. <laughs> You know, so the kids had a lot of insight around the first, our first group of, we had four kids, our first group, and they had a lot of insight for us in terms of like what didn't work and what didn't, and mostly did work. That, that was one of the few things that stands out to me because it was kind of funny and humorous. Um, another thing I would say that's a little bit different in Wisconsin is the, um, the level of polishing up your look. So I think in, in LA, the kids are in general just more into their look. <laughs> They're more into like, you know, do they have the right phone and they have the right clothes and Wisconsin yes. it's a bit more hit and miss <laughs> so um so we've kind of adapted that a little bit too to be like you know be be who you are you know in Wisconsin and, and the, I, the hope is that you find your tribe and we help you do that um wherever they may be in Wisconsin so yeah um but really kind of kind of focusing on that helping people navigate the context adolescence is a hard transition for everybody young adulthood is a hard transition for everybody I haven't talked much about the preschool model. Um, it's more play-based, but that's tough too. Um, but these these really big developmental transitions, you know, require kind of a ramping up and a figuring out period. And you know, our our hope is that with peers, we can kind of help that go more smoothly and help people be more successful. Um, and really yeah. shifting and having those rich social networks that they that they desire to have. And and not only the social. Um, I found Max now works at a uh, supermarket, and uh, he's going to community college and he works as a checker. And those social skills are very important at work with your coworkers that you're liked. And um, he said, if he did not have these skills, I don't think he would have succeeded at his job, honestly. Yeah, a lot of workplace interaction, right? There's, there's yeah. a lot there that, that is, is kind of the same set, you know, in a lot of ways of skills of how do you, you know, getting along, like, you know, kind of finding points of common interest with other people. Um, it applies to the workplace too. Yeah, definitely. Okay, and I think that's maybe I have one more just to kind of a uh, yeah acknowledgement. So to thank everyone, uh, I'd like to thank UCLA and Liz Logison for sharing with us the model so that we can bring it to the Midwest. Um, all of our grad student facilitators and um, our data people that have helped with data. We have uh, speech path grad students that also have helped with the groups and undergrads. Um, some colleagues and departments at Marquette. So we have nursing and speech pathology and education that, that assist. Um, and of course, our families uh, and the Autism Society. So one of our first funding uh, opportunities was through the Dillon's Run funding from the Autism Society. So we're very grateful for that. That enabled us to bring peers um, to Wisconsin, as well as from Marquette and from NIH uh, to support the research that we do, which supports the groups that we do, which helps us reach more families. Um, so Thanks to all of those folks. And I'm, I would be happy to take any questions if there are any. And everybody, if you haven't been on one of these Zoom, down at the bottom, if you put your cursor over the bottom of your screen, you will get a Q&A balloon. You can click on that and ask questions and we'll be able to read them to Amy. To start it off, I did have one question, Amy. When you were talking about the actual changes in the structure of the brain. You know, you said something about the amygdala um, being fight or flight. Um, are there other things that could be going on with the amygdala and the changes of increasing the social behaviors um, as like different anxiety or emotional things outside of just general fight or flight? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So um, both in terms of um, emotion, um, I would say initiating of uh, social interaction that is kind of tagging it as emotionally important, right? So kind of motivated social initiation and how do we tag that as important in the brain, uh, something that we want to focus on. Um, and it does have the, the connections with anxiety and depression, kind of the mental health, emotion regulation kind of domains as well. Um, uh, what we had found with our, our volume studies were I would say the links are strongest to anxiety. Um, at this stage. Uh, so right now, when we see decreases in anxiety, we're also seeing changes in the volume of the amygdala kind of related, those two things related together. So yeah. it, it's kind of goes from, I mean, the amygdala is normally kind of references the lizard brain type of mm -hmm. section. Mm -hmm. And so it's basically social people scary to people 
fun. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a big part of peers is that, you know, the reason why I love that it's 14 weeks long is that that gives us the time to establish success in social interactions um, that overlays the past negative experiences, right? So for us, one of the worst possible scenarios is that kids drop out at like session six or seven because they haven't had success yet. And then we've been kind of building up on things that are anxiety producing, right? We've been saying, okay, we want you to call your, your this other kid in the group. We want you to um, think about joining a new social group. And so dropping out, if they're gonna drop or like do it within sessions one, two or three, but don't go any further because then it kind of builds the anxiety and they don't have the success, right? So after mm -hmm. about session seven, we start to see successes, the kids get more confident and it really almost becomes like an exposure-based treatment and that they're doing these calls and these social opportunities over and over and over again every week that are overlaying positive, 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 you know, as much as we can, right? Um, and it gives the time for that to happen, which is really crucial for that to happen. Amy, one of the dads asked what age is appropriate for the adolescence program. My son's turning 13 soon. I'm wondering yeah. if that's too young. Yes. Um, so that is not too young. I would say we have had, so peers, uh, technically they go from, for the adolescents, 11 to 18. Uh, we do not at Marquette take 11 year olds uh, into groups. So we'll take 12 year olds into groups, but 11 tends to be a little bit too young. Um, there's uh, a lot of the content is really about taking ownership on the social opportunities and calling other kids. And the 11 year olds are still just a little bit too much under, under play date kind of mode with parents kind of more controlling that. So, and they're also, I would say our 11 year olds are not as socially motivated yet. So when they haven't hit that, like, oh, this is important, right? This getting to know other kids and like other kids are doing in high school or middle school, they don't kind of have that awareness yet of the importance. Um, so we start at 12 uh, and recommending 12 just for our Wisconsin groups and then going up to 18. Yeah, and I'd even say that a 12 year old really doesn't have the, the confidence to tell their parents no in any real sense. Whereas I think a 13 year old does. <laughs> right. There is that too. <laughs> there is that too, for sure. And then another father asked, how is the peers model for teens different from that for adults? Yes. Um, so they're actually very similar. Uh, a lot of the same content. So, and we have had families, um, we have kind of a waiting list. So we don't tend to let families repeat unless we have like a random open spot but we let families repeat the teen and the young adult. So they can come back to the young adult model once their teen is 18. Um, and it is a lot of uh, the same material, um, joining conversations, uh, having get togethers, um, uh, making phone calls, those kinds of skills, um, except that the adult model adds on dating. So it, it dips its toes into dating and, and how do you let someone know that you like them? How do you ask them out on a date? How does the date go? And it really is just the surface. <laughs> so it doesn't, there could probably be a whole another peers on love. Um, I think they're working on that actually. <laughs> um, but it dips the toes into that. And then also kind of addresses as well, like workplace bullying and how to handle that specifically. Um, so the, the young adult model kind of adds on those developmentally appropriate, um, you know, dating and uh, workplace things that's not in the teen model. So that was a great question. Yeah, it was. I think Max was in the teen. So you have adult, teen, and adolescent? Uh, we have just teen and uh, adolescent and adult, right? So they're the two. Um, so um, our uh, adolescent groups, 12 to 18, and then actually used to be 12 to 16 because of the brain stuff. So 18 was going a little too far into adult brain. But yeah. now that we're, we're wrapping up some of the brain studies. We're 12 to 18 and then 18 to 28 for our young adult groups. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, I think that's all the questions we had. I know I learned a lot. Um, so. I, I'm a huge nerd, and so I have some additional questions for Amy. Um, yeah, you want? I'm here. <laughs> I, I was I was wondering um, two different questions. One, based off of what you said about the amygdala, it almost sounds like the peers program is like a social phobia program, mm -hmm. um, and and can maybe there's there's differences there, um, but then on top of that, um, what have you seen about the the learning abilities and the difference between the teen and the adult brain? Like once, mm -hmm. do you see some a little bit more neuroplasticity? Are they able to learn more quickly? Are there any differences there? 
Is it better yes. to get them in early as possible? Yes, yes. So, um, you know, social phobia, that would be that would be a really interesting comparison group, right? Um, I know some of the anxiety groups that they run are that they're mixed, though they're mixed with kids with anxiety and other kids with depression and things at UCLA. But it would be very interesting to look at, you know, people with social phobia and how they responded to this model, because it is, like I said, that kind of exposure and that layering on of positive, um, positive uh, experiences to kind of overlay. Um, there definitely is that flavor to it. Um, I think another piece of it is the group dynamic. Um, so I think it really is key that the kids are in the group together, the parents are in their group. So everyone is learning together and supporting each other and, and live practicing with each other. And I think a lot of social phobia treatments now are really more one-on-one -on -one with a therapist. And so um, it would be interesting to see how that could translate. Um, uh, as far as learning uh, opportunities, I would say that the, well, the young adult groups, because of the additional material, are 16 sessions rather than 14. Um, but I would say, you know, if we look at in the teen group when we see successes starting to happen, um, they, they're earlier in the teen group than they are in the young adult group. And I think that could be partly, um, I feel like I, I talked to Liz about this once about what their data looked like with young adults and she kind of confirmed it, but it also could be in Wisconsin, many of our young adults coming in um, have had pretty limited services for a pretty long time. So they've been out of school and then what they had in school was not very much or very ideal. And so we're starting from a place of more severe isolation in the young adults. Um, the kids, the teenagers, they are still in school. They may not have friends, but they're at least exposed to other kids. Um, our young adults are oftentimes very limited in, in what exposure they get to other young adults. Um, sometimes they, you know, they're not, if they're not employed, they're not exposed to people at work. Um, they're not in school. Um, you know, depending on their, their situation, they can be kind of more, more chronically isolated. And I would say that takes longer to have the success, right? You're kind of fighting upstream a bit more than you are with the teenagers. So we often would see more successes with our young adults starting more like around session 12, for example, whereas in the teens, it's like seven. So it's like five sessions earlier, I would say. And I don't know that it's that it takes them longer to learn. I just think that the the starting place is different. Um, and then, you know, the, the years of, of time that has gone by where, um, you know, that they've been struggling, that, that adds on to something that you're working with uh, when you're starting out. So. That makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amy, do you have right, well, any information about, do you collect any information about um, bullying experiences? before people go through peers? And does that affect how willing people are to make themselves vulnerable or reach out to others? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, a, that's another really good question. Um, because we ask about, you know, we have kind of different surveys and things that we use that are looking at like, you know, just general like mood, right? Depression or anxiety, or um, we ask about, you know, like how many times have you had a phone call in the past month or, or hung out with someone? Um, but we don't ask specific questions about bullying or I would say trauma, right? So I think that that's actually an area that is growing kind of even more, I would say recently, which is still too late. <laughs> like it should have been something people focused on years ago. It's both um, generalized trauma in autism and social trauma from, from bullying. So I think bullying is something we know kind of is happening. Um, we at Marquette have not been not questioning kids about it. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not honestly sure why we haven't questioned about it. I know in the program, we talk about like steps to handle bullying, but we actually, we tell the kids like, we're not going to talk about your, your own personal past experiences because in the group setting, if they start talking about their, their personal experiences of being bullied, it kind of causes a contagion where all the kids get really upset and get really agitated. And it kind of, it becomes very hard to handle um, all the emotions that are happening. So we say, you know, we're going to focus today on how to avoid it in the future. We know it happens to almost everybody, and we're going to focus on how to avoid it. Um, but we don't really dive in with the kids in terms of their history. The parents sometimes will talk about the history and about how to handle um, some of that history. Um, but the area of, you know, of trauma, whether that's from um, abuse from other people or bullying, 
is something I think that we really, we have to consider because I think what could be happening too with some of the teens that we have come in that refuse to be in the group and that say, no, I don't wanna be here and they refuse, which given that we're research, we have to say, okay, then, you know, like come back to us in a few years, if you would like, you know, we, we can't force a kid to be in a group if they say no. And I do wonder whether for those individuals, they have a history, right? They have a history that is just so, so strong and negative that they can't fathom doing this, you know, that they're that, um, that that experience with other teens was so traumatic that for them, this is painful, right? And, and so I think that's something that would be really good to explore in terms of do those kids and those young adults as well even need something additional before peers to kind of bring them back to a place where they can be ready to learn. Because I think when you're dealing with emotional effects of trauma and of bullying and everything else that's really strong, you're not in a place of learning, you're in a place of surviving. And so I think we need to do probably an extra add-on treatment before that to kind of help them get to a place where they can learn this and where it's not going to just trigger them like immediately. So that's a really good question. Can I ask you a practical question for the parents? When's the next one and is it full? Yeah, so our next group, we don't run groups in the summer because the grad students go AWOL. Um, but we, uh, and I think UCLA does though, but we, we do not. So our groups start in August and in January. And the next group, as I mentioned, because of all the uh, pandemic will be online. So it will be a remote group uh, over telehealth um, starting in probably late August, um, maybe like first September even. Um, uh, and so we'll be reaching out to families. So what we've done with, we have a kind of a long waiting list, but what we've done with our waiting list now is that we call families in groups of about 25 and each like 25 families on, then we call the next 25 because oftentimes what happens is that people will be on the list, but not really ready, you know, like, we, oh, it's not gonna work for us this year or it's not gonna work this, this fall. And so that way we're able to say, okay, well, we've called these 25 and we've gotten two. So let's move on to the next 25 and get two more. And so each group can have up to 10. So I tell people that even if they're like, I don't know if we'll get off the waiting list to go ahead and put yourself on because sometimes we'll get to the end of the list and it's people who have just called. Um, and that does happen. Or we'll have a kid drop out, we'll have a space last minute, that kind of thing. Um, so we're, we're getting better at managing that and, and there are opportunities sometimes to get in right away. Great, great. And, and so you haven't mentioned this, I just know from my own experience, there is a significant parent commitment too. Yes, the parent commitment is weekly, right? So yeah. it's the parent group running with the kids, running in a separate room or with uh, the Zoom online groups that would be the parent group running generally at a different time. So uh, bandwidth is a little challenging to do parent and teen at the same time uh, for many home bandwidth and our bandwidth. <laughs> um, so what we've been doing is running the parent group right after the, the teen group uh, on Zoom. So the kids just pass the device to their parents and we just spend about 45 minutes with the parents. Um, and uh, that's weekly as well. And that, rather than it being a class format, it's more of a support group format of like, how are the practicing of these skills going? How can we troubleshoot? helping you to achieve these goals for your, your teen and, and so forth. So it's kind of a nice, um, and then brainstorming with the other parents. Is, a lot of people find that really helpful. Yeah, I liked, I liked my group, so. Yeah. Anyway. Well, thank you, Amy. Thank all you right, thank you. Great. Well, thank you all, thank you for, for listening. Thank you. All right, and we will be signing off and you can find this on both the Autism Society website and probably by the end of the week and, and on the Gemini one as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Right, bye.